Hi friends, today we will talk about approach to a patient with acute coronary syndrome. We will understand how to evaluate it and how to approach it with particular attention to its management. First is the disclaimer. This video is made for only educational purpose and there is no endorsement for any brand or company. Acute coronary syndrome includes three entities, unstable angina, non-ST elevation MI and STA elevation MI. So whenever we say acute coronary syndrome, it includes unstable angina, non-ST elevation MI and ST elevation MI. What is angina? Uh, angina is a typical chest pain which has uh, three characteristic features. The patient feels pain in the chest, neck, jaw, shoulder or he may have arm discomfort and these symptoms are usually brought by the exertion, uh, I mean physical exertion and he gets relieved with these symptoms with the rest or nitrites. If these three features are present, we call it as a, as a typical anginal pain. If out of these three only two features are present, then we call it as a atypical angina and if only one symptom or one feature is present, we call it as a non-cardiac chest pain. So, uh, this angina can be stable, unstable, decubitus, prismatal angina. Stable angina is the patient feels chest pain or chest discomfort on exertion and it is relieved by the rest. Unstable angina is when the patient feels chest pain on rest or with minimal exertion and initially if he says that he didn't have any pain or when he used to walk 100 steps or 100 meter uh, then it was okay but now uh, when he is just moving 100 st uh, steps or 50 to 70 steps he is getting chest pain then we will say it has an unstable angina and means there is increase in its severity is also there and frequency is also there the angina which is felt by the individual while lied, lying down it is called decubitus angina and prince melter angina is uh, when the when there is spasm of the coronary arteries the patients feel chest and uh, but the other features are normal so what is angina pectoris the hair the it is also ischemic type of a chest pain uh, this type uh, this anginal chest pain is usually due to uh, the demand and uh, angina chest pain is due to supply and demand mismatch in the cardiac muscles so uh, when do we say angina pectoris when the chest pain is last for only 2 to 10 minutes it is relieved by the rest and it is not associated with other features like vomiting we call it as angina pectoris and when the patient has a chest pain which lasts for more than 30 minutes and it is not relieved with the rest and it is associated with other symptoms of vomiting diaphoresis then we call it as a uh, myocardial infarction so whenever the patient of a chest pain comes to us in emergency room if he has a central type of chest pain or patient has a sensation of pressure squeezing gripping heaviness tightness exertional or stress related or has a retrostomial chest pain then the, there are chances that it is a ischemic type of a chest pain uh, on the contrary if he has a sharp flitting shifting pleurotic or positional chest pain the chances of ischemia are very less so as we know that uh, in the pathophysiology of the 
acute coronary syndrome first there occurs accumulation of the lipids in the vessels wall then uh, lipids they are oxidized and they are consumed by the macrophages we call them as a foam cell and then there occurs subsequent deposition of the extracellular mat matrix calcium proliferation of the smooth muscle cell and all this leads to plaque formation we can see the plaques and this leads to the narrowing of the lumen of the uh, coronaries in angina the plaque results in the stenosis and there is reduced blood flow to the tissues and it due to while patient uh, is in getting exerted then this leads to chest pain and but there is no infarction no infarction means death of the tissues but when the plaque ruptures there occurs uh, shifting of the ruptured thrombus or plaque to distal artery where the it causes occlusion of the coronaries and this leads to the infarction so when do we say stable angina unstable angina non st elevation mi and st elevation mi here the patient has a chest pain on exertion and it is uh, when the patient exerts there is increased demand of uh, blood in the myocardial tissues but due to the plaque formation the supply of the blood to the tissue is reduced or uh, it doesn't come up with the demands of the tissues this leads to myocardial ischemia but here the ecg is normal and the cardiac markers like troponin is also normal in case of unstable angina there the plaque may ruptures there may be formation of the thrombus around the ruptured plaque and it leads to the partial occlusion of the coronaries and the patient gets chest pain at the rest and uh, this chest pains develops over a period of time ecg may shows or may not show stt changes means there may be st depression or inverted t waves or ecg may be normal here also the troponin levels are normal in case of non st elevation mi the plaque ruptures there occurs thrombus formation it causes the partial occlusion of the vessels and uh, this leads to sub endocardial uh myocardium infarction the patient will have ecg changes there will be st or t wave inversions but the troponin levels will be elevated and the ecg may at times can be normal but usually the patient may have stt changes and but the troponin levels will be elevated in case of st elevation mi there is complete occlusion of the blood vessels and this results in the transmural injury of the myocardium and it is reflected in the ecg as a st elevation or hyperacute t waves so there will be st elevation in the ecg troponin levels will be raised in non st elevation mi the there may be ecg changes or there ecg changes may be normal means ecg changes in the form of t wave inversion or st depression troponin levels will be elevated in unstable angina ecg changes may be there but the cardiac uh, parameters the troponin levels will be normal in stable angina ecg will be normal and troponin will be normal so whenever the patient comes to us with uh, chest pain we must rule out in emergency uh, these uh, emergency emergent causes of the chest pain uh, four causes are related to the heart two to the lungs and one to the esophagus among the heart uh, related causes we should rule out acute coronary syndrome aortic dissection pericarditis or myocarditis pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade and in the lungs we must rule out pulmonary embolism or pneumothorax and we must rule out esophageal perforation also this is the differential diagnosis of various types of chest pain important causes of chest pain like anginal chest pain may last for more than 2 minutes but less than 10 minutes it's a, it is felt as a pressure tightness sensation 
and uh, MI pain usually lasts more than 30 minutes it is similar to angina but uh, at times it may not get relieved with the nitroglycerin and ECG will show ST elevation or ST depression with elevation of the myocardial sorry troponin markers troponin enzymes aortic stenosis stenotic pain is also a sudden type of chest pain and it is felt uh, sorry aortic stenosis pain is also chest pain it is exertional but at times it may present with history of syncope or dyspnea mm, auscultation, uh, auscultation will show ejection systolic murmur pericarditis chest pains usually it is slowly progressive it remains for hours to days it is also sharp type of chest pain it is relieved by sitting up or leaning forward on auscultation we may hurt pericardial rub pain of aortic dissection is very severe abrupt onset tearing or ripping type of chest pain knife like it radiates back between the shoulder blades it is an emergency patient may have a history of Marfan syndrome or uh, any other underlying uh, connective tissue disorder but uh, we have to rule out on M similar to the patients of M pulmonary embolism they may present with sudden onset chest pain uh, these patients will have a dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, hypotension EC is not very diagnostic but uh, CT pulmonary angio and uh, right history will definitely help us to uh, come to the diagnosis just uh, a few words about aortic dissection the risk factors are hypertension smoking bicuspid aortic valve coarctation of the aorta connective tissue disorders elderly patients morphin syndrome pain is retrosternal sudden onset very severe sharp tearing it radiates back to the interscapular region patient may have a syncope limb weakness bp if we compare the bp in two arms we may find more than 10 mm of difference in the systolic blood pressure there may be radio radial delay or radio femoral delay ecg is very not very diagnostic diagnostic but uh, chest x-ray may show widened media steinum CT autogram will show dissecting flaps. This is a widened uh, media uh, There are two types of uh, aortic dissection type A and type B. Type A requires urgent uh, surgical rep uh, repair, and type B usually managed medically uh, by controlling the blood pressure. Our target here should be reduce the systolic blood pressure to 100 to 120 mm of mercury and reduce the heart rate to about 60 to 70 per minute similar the pain of chest pain of pericarditis is also retrosternal pleuritic type of chest pain it is relieved with sitting upright or uh, leaning forward patient will have a history of recent mi or history of ckd or post viral infection may be there history of autoimmune diseases like sle should be ruled out patient will have a pericardial friction rub on auscultation and it is best heard at the left lower left sternal edge ecg will show widespread concave st elevation so if we see uh, st elevation will be concave type in mi the st elevation is usually convex type so that's why i put ha i have put a smiley like this that ST elevation will be diffuse and concave type in most of the uh, leads ST elevation will be more in lead 2 as compared to 3 there will be no Q wave formation there will be PR depressions and this is how we can diagnose the pericarditis x-ray will show globular heart uh, and uh, treatment is usually the treatment of the cause or we have to at times drain the uh, fluid from the pericardial cavity similar to the patient of a pulmonary embolism they will have a very sharp knife like pain 
the massive pulmonary embolism cases they rep uh, rep report with retrosternal chest pain or at times with syncope fever risk factors for pulmonary embolism are hypercoagulability immobility long hours of flight recent major surgery malignancy patient will have a history of deep vein thrombosis or patient may have leg pain leg swelling cough tenderness patient may present with tachycardia hypotension elevated jvp chest x ray will show wedge shaped infarction color doppler may show some non compressive venous segment in the limbs ecg will show sinus tachycardia and few patient may show s1 q3 t3 waves pattern but this is not very specific serum d dimer levels are uh, done they are very if they are raised then probability of pulmonary embolism is there but if they are not raised serum d dimer is normal then the pulmonary embolism is ruled out so we have to thrombolyze such patient we can do embolectomy anticoagulant ctpa is very useful in such cases so coming to the acute coronary syndrome the patient will present to us with chest pain or uh, feeling of pressure sensation and uh, 80% of the patients in the emergency room they present with chest pain or uh, pressure sensation and other feature like diaphoresis epigastric pain indigestion shoulder pain uh, these can be features uh, but especially in some female patients they may have history of dizziness nausea vomiting jaw neck pain shortness of breath and uh, these patients may have history of uh, may present with palpitation and fatigue also if the acute coronary syndrome is not treated it may end up with the complications like early complications complications are tachyarrhythmias like in the form of ventricular fibrillation bradyarrhythmias, 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 bradyarrhythmias acute heart failure pericarditis ventricular septal defect mitral regurgitation left ventricular wall rupture and the, uh, the late complication are dressler syndrome chronic heart failure left ventricular aneurysm so whenever the patient of acute coronary syndrome reports to us in emergency room and if we see abnormal ecg we have to take the proper history and uh, and our priority should be stabilize the patient so if the patient when comes to us in the emergency room we have to do his ecg rule out st elevation non st elevation etc do his cardiac biomarkers if pain is more than 3 to 4 hours chest x ray is done to rule out pneumothorax aortic dissection pneumonia effusion pulmonary embolism d dimer is done to rule out pulmonary embolism b type natriuretic peptide is done to rule out heart failure 2d echo to rule out aortic dissection ct echocardiogram mi and to see the right one uh, so regional wall motion abnormalities stress echo or tmt if ecg is normal ct coronary angiogram or coronary angiogram followed by angioplasty if coronary occlusion is there cardiac mr is done to rule out any structural or functional evaluation of the heart and chest vasculature gadolinium enhanced cardiac mr detects early detects uh, uh, leads to early detection of the mi so whenever the patient present with a chest pain we have to do his ecg ecg may comes normal there may be st depression st elevation or some sort of arrhythmias if the ecg is normal or st depression is there it, it can be non st elevation mi if there is st elevation then it could be st elevation mi we will do his uh, troponin levels if troponin levels are raised and there is st elevation then it is st elevation mi if troponin levels are elevated and there is depression sorry st uh, this troponin levels are normal and there is st depression or t wave changes may t uh, t wave inversion or there is no changes in the t wave it could be st non st elevation mi so if the in the patient of unstable angina the there may be no ecg changes or is maybe non specific ecg changes and the cardiac uh, markers like troponin that will not be elevated that will be normal this will be unstable angina if there is st depression or t wave changes uh, is inverted and uh, cardiac troponin levels are elevated this is 
non st elevation mi and if there is st elevation in the ecg and rise in the troponin level it is a st elevation mi so the cardiac biomarker which we do initially we used to do myoglobulin we can do cardiac for this cpk and cpk mb troponin uh, coming to the troponin t and i it usually takes 2 to 3 hours post uh, chest pain to rise and it uh, remains elevated for 18 to 24 hours troponin t usually remains elevated for 5 to 7 days and troponin i remains elevated for up to 10 to 14 days it is trop i is more these are troponin t or i are more specific and they have a prognostic significance cpk that is creatinine phosphokinin and ck cpk mb this is more specific for the cardiac tissues and if cpk mb and cpk ratio is more than 5 then uh, or we can say cpk mb is uh, more than equal to 5% of the total cpk then we can think of myocardial injury uh, nowadays we do high sensitive uh, cardiac troponin levels this is the latest it detects very low level of troponin i normal levels are 14 nanogram per liter and it has improved it has led to the increased diagnostic accuracy but uh, whenever we do the cardiac troponin levels uh, we should also take a proper history because cardiac troponin levels are also raised in cardiac causes and non cardiac cases causes among the cardiac causes where the troponin levels are raised they are cardiac trauma cardiac surgery cardioversion endomyocardial biopsy acute chronic heart failure aortic dissection aortic valve diseases hypertrophic cardiomyopathy various arrhythmias and post pci rhabdomyolysis myocarditis non cardiac causes which can lead to elevated troponin levels of pulmonary embolism severe pulmonary hypertension renal failure stroke cardiotoxic drug critical illness sepsis extensive burn and extreme exertion so whenever the patients of uh, chest pain comes to us and we do his ecg and uh, before that first of all look for his airway breathing and circulation try to maintain then if his oxygen saturation less than 90 then do give him oxygen and for the chest pain he may be given morphine uh, but whenever morphine is given uh, we have to give metoclopramide as anti emetic because morphine Uh, causes uh, morphine has a emetic effect in the same time before being uh, the test which are ecg cardiac troponin levels where whatever we have we are going to send uh, before that we have to give them antiplatelets like aspirin in the loading dose of 300 mg clopidogrel 300 mg and statin can be given as a 18 80 mg in a loading dose and uh, we can give nitroglycerin or uh, anti g tablets beta blockers can be given but may, uh, make it sure that patient should not have any history of asthma heart failure hypotension or bad arrhythmias so if the patient if you are sure that patient is has st elevation mi and you are going to shift the patient for uh, percutaneous coronary intervention then we can give the loading dose of ticagrelor or in a loading dose of 180 mg and both prosugrel and ticagrelor are preferred over clopidogrel in pca patients so the diagnostic criteria for st elevation mi is that there should be st elevation in two or more leads that is v2 or v3 in if we see v2 or v3 there should be st elevation more than or equal to 2.5 mm in men less than 40 it should be more than equal to 2 mm in men more than 40 years of age and it should be more than equal to 1.5 mm in women and in all other leads it sh- there should be 1 mm elevation at least and along with this patient may have a new onset left ventral branch block for non st elevation mi st depression in two or more leads sh- should be more than equal to 0.5 mm and it should be accompanied or there may be no t wave inversion of more than 1 mm if it t wave inversion is there it should be more than equal to 1 mm deep and it should be dynamic remember that 
T wave may be inverted in V1, AVR and lead 3 which is normal. So ST elevation MI is also seen in other condition also we can remember this with mnemonic elevation like electrolytes disbalance like hyperkalemia, left ventral branch block, early repolarization, ventricular hypertrophy, aneurysm, tocosubo disease, infarction of the myocardio, um, Osborne waves, non atherosclerotic vessel spasm. So if we see the ECG, the anterior leads are, uh, anterior septal leads are V1 to V4 and the, it is supplied by the left anterior descending artery, inferior leads are 2, 3 AVF and then this is supplied by the uh, inferior ventricle is supplied by the RCA or inferior part of the heart is supplied by the RCA or the LCX later leads are lead 1 AVL V5 V6 and it is supplied by the left circumflex artery or diagonal branch of LED whenever we see the ST elevation we have to see the reciprocal ST depression in the other leads reciprocal leads also for example in anterior MI there is ST elevation only in V1 to V6 there is no reciprocal uh, changes in other leads and it the coronary artery involves the left anterior descender descending artery uh, later MI the ST elevation will be seen in the lead 1 AVL, AVL V5 V6 and the reciprocal changes are seen in 2 3 AVF Similarly, in the inferior wall MI, ST elevation is seen in lead 2, 3 AVF. Reciprocal changes are seen in lead 1 AVL. And the coronary artery involved is the right coronary artery or the right circumflex arteries. Posterior wall MI, is, ST elevation is seen in V7, V8, V9. And we can see reciprocal changes in high R in V1 to V3, ST depression in V1 to V3, more than 2 mm. Right wall, right ventricle MI, ST elevation will be seen in V1 and V4R and uh, reciprocal ST depression is seen in lead 1 AVL and the coronary in artery involved is the right coronary artery. Atrial MI is seen in the PTA in the tau waves we can say uh, in lead 1 V5 V6 and uh, reciprocal changes are seen in the lead 1, 2 or 3 and the right coronary artery is involved. This is non ST elevation MI. We can see the ST depression is there in the V5, V6, V. This is V4. And here while MI, we can see the ST elevation in the lead 1, V1, V2, V3. Uh, and the reciprocal changes are not seen. Okay. Uh, Inferior wall MI, we can see lead 2, 3, ABF. This is ABF, ST elevation. And lead 1, AVL. This is ABL, V5, V6. Uh, we are seeing the reciprocal changes. So, whenever the patient of a chest pain comes to us, and uh, whether we received a call, and he is brought by the ambulance to the hospital within 10 minutes we should be able to make out the diagnosis we have to do the ECG and find out whether he is having uh, ST elevation or not if the, there is ST elevation diagnosis is made we have to see whether we can shift the patient to primary PCI center if the primary PCI center can be reached within two hours less, that is less than 120 minutes so we will not thrombolize the patient we will just send the patient to primary PCI center and if we see that primary PCI center can he cannot be sent to the primary PCI center it is very far away or it will take more than 120 minutes or more than uh, two hours then we can thrombolize the patient fibrinolize the patient and thereafter we will send him to the uh, for the uh, PCI okay if the patient directly report to non pci centers similarly we will uh, follow the same strategy if the patient directly report to the pci center diagnosis made within a 10 minutes that he is having st elevation we will do the primary pci and after the primary pci uh, is done then we will see again whether the patient has any problem or not so 
whenever the patient of a patient comes to us stme is diagnosed or not diagnosed we will give it aspirin if he is planned for pci we will give him a loading dose of prasuglar or clopidogrel whatever is available we will also give unfractionated heparin so if we sure if we are sure that he can be sent to the pci enable center within 2 hours that is less than 2 hours then we will give him aspirin we will give him prosugrel or clopidogrel we will give him heparin and then we will send him to pci center if we know that the pci center is very far or there is a difficulty in sending our patients as symptoms of onset is quite long and the pci enable center is more than 2 uh, hours away then we will thrombolize the patient and uh, after thrombolysis we can again send to the send for the pci so uh, we are, should always remember that whenever the patient of a chest pain comes to us and we have made the diagnosis of st elevation mi then the initial 1 hour is very important and initial 6 hour is a 6 uh, hour is a time where we can salvage the myocardium the first hour is the golden hour first four hours first hour is the golden hour and first six hour are very crucial in the management of st elevation mi if we see that from 15 minutes to 6 hour the after 6 hour most of the micro, my this uh, myocardial infarction necrosis of the cardiac muscle has set in and this is a reversible process so patient whenever reports towards for uh, with st elevation mi once the st elevation mi is diagnosed we have the option of doing fibrinolysis or pti or coronary artery bypass grafting so we will follow the same rule if the pci enable center is uh, near to us or where we can send the patient within 2 hours then we will send him to for pci if we think that the pci center cannot be approached within 2 hours then we will do is fibrinolysis so for primary percutaneous coronary entry, uh, interventions uh, it is very effective and it should be done within 6 hours okay this is the golden periods we can salvage the myocardium it has been seen that if the primary pci is done within 6 hours uh then if there is delay in pci we have seen the 65 lives saved per 1000 if treated within 1 hour and 10 lives are saved per 1000 if treated between 6 and 12 hours so this is this shows how crucial is the time that is that's why we say time is muscle so if we think that the patient cannot be sent for PCI as a PCI center is quite away or facilities for PCI are not available nearby then we will uh, thrombolize the patient we have two types of uh, fibrinolytic agent fibrin specific and fibrin non specific and fibrin specific they act only on the clot bound thrombin these are alteplase, retiplase, tenectiplase and fibrin non specific or systemic lytic or streptokinase or urokinase there are few indications and contraindications for the use of sorry few absolute contraindication and relative contraindications for the use of uh, fibrinolysis or thrombolysis absolute contraindications are any prior history of intracranial hemorrhage known structural cerebral vascular lesion for example arteriovenous malformation any known malignant intracranial neoplasm ischemic stroke within three months except acute ischemic stroke within 4.5 hours suspected aortic dissection, active bleeding or bleeding diathesis, any history of close head or facial trauma within 3 months, intracranial or intraspinal surgery within 2 months, severe uncontrolled hypertension unresponsive to emergency therapy, and if there is any history of uh, use of streptokinase in the previous 6 months, and the relative uh, contraindications are chronic, severely poor controlled hypertension, systemic hypertension, on presentation if the BP is more than 180 or diastolic blood pressure more than 110 history of prior ischemic stroke dementia known intracranial pathology not covered in the absolute traumatic or prolonged CPR major surgery 
pregnancy, active peptic ulcer, oral, patient is on oral anticoagulant therapy. So whenever we give streptokinase, uh, it is given as a 1.5 million unit over 30 to 60 minute. It is given as a IV. It is mixed with 100 ml normal saline and it is administered over 30 to 60 minutes. And when we are giving it for 30 to 60 minutes, we have to monitor the ECG, SpO2 and BP every 5 minutes and watch for reperfusion arrhythmias. It is highly antigenic and it is contraindicated if it is used in previous 6 months. Similarly, we can use retiplase, alteplase, tenectiplase, dose is given in the chart. Patency rate uh, seen with the uh, this streptokinase is uh, after 90 minutes is 60 to 80 percent and TIMI 3 flow is 32 percent. TIMI 3 flow in the retiplase is 60 percent and atiplase it is 54 percent and tenectiplase it is 63 percent and patency rate at 60 minutes is 85 percent. Tenectiplase is quite effective. Whenever we are planning to thrombolize the patient, we should check the BP of the patient in both arms. We have to do monitor his continuous ECG, SpO2 and BP every 5 minutes. We have to give oxygen to the patient if it is SpO2 is less than 90%. Use two IV lines, 18 gauge IV lines or 16 gauge IV line. We, have, we should always keep uh, Emergency tray which contains avil, hydrocard, normal saline, dopamine drip or noradrenaline infusion handy. Uh, give IV lasix in case if the, you suspect the patient may have a pulmonary edema. We should always keep a defibrillator uh, nearby us uh, or near the emergency room or in the ambulance where we are uh, planning to give him uh, thrombolysis. So, if we thrombolize the patient, how will we know that it is a successful thrombolysis? There will be resolution of ST elevation by at least 50% compared to the basal ECG at 60 to 90 minutes from the starting thrombolytic therapy. Patient will have a relief of pain and symptoms. There will be new reperfusion arrhythmias, AIV, RBT, and patient will be hemodynamically uh, getting stable. There will be resolution of the hypertension. And how can we say that patient their thrombolysis has failed? There will be worsening of the ischemia. Patient will have uh, hemodynamic instability or electrical instability. The ST segment resolution will be less than 50% in the chest lead or less than 75% in the inferior leads on in CCG done at 60 minutes. Or in such so we will have to shift the patient for the rescue PCI. If the patient reports to after, after 12 hours of the chest pain, should we do thrombolysis? No. Ideally, we should not do. There are increase, especially in the elderly. There is, uh, elderly will have increased risk of mortality. The patient will have increased risk of intrathrenal hemorrhage, myocardial rupture. There will be reperfusion injury. The PCI is preferred if presenting after 12 hours. Fibrinolysis can be done if there is ongoing ischemia with large areas at risk and unstable and hemodynamically electrical instability is there when PCI facility is not available. The complication of the thrombolysis are there is increased risk of stroke or intracranial hemorrhage, there is increased risk of other bleeding, especially uh, the patient who is undergoing prolonged or traumatic resuscitation. The risk factor for intracranial hemorrhages are the elderly patient, if the patient has low weight, female patients prior cerebrovascular disease, systolic or diastolic hypertension or admission. Intracranial bleeding has been seen in 0.9 to 1% of the patient. Post thrombolysis, we should shift the patient uh, for coronary angiography or uh, for the PCI and within 2 to 24 the patient should be sent for angiogram. Ensure that ambulance is on the standby when you decide for thrombolysis, this is I have, I have already discussed. So when the patients uh, with uh, this acute coronary syndrome comes to us and uh, we thrombolize or we fibrinolyze or we do the PCI, what next we have to do? 
in high bleeding risk patients and in high bleeding risk and non high bleeding risk patient we usually try to give a dual antiplatelet therapy for one month zero to one month we can give dual antiplatelet in non high bleeding risk patient they can be given dual antiplatelet therapy for 3 months or 6 months it depends on the um, person or the prescription of the uh, treating doctor or the treating cardiologist uh, there after after 6 months uh, we can put the patient on a, this uh, p2 y12 inhibitor or uh, aspirin monotherapy we can continue with the either of the two Similarly, uh, patient with acute coronary syndrome in whom we should give oral anticoagulants for initial one week we can give oral anticoagulant plus dual antiplatelet therapy from one week to one month we can, up to one month we can continue one month to three month we can give this uh, new oral anticoagulant plus single antiplatelet therapy and this can be continued for six months and from six on months to nine months onward dual and uh, we can give new oral anticoagulants plus single antiplatelet therapy and after 12 months we should try to give uh, monotherapy in the form of new oral anticoagulants after 12 months so patient with the, if the patient comes to us with multi vessel coronary artery disease if the patient comes with a cardiogenic shock we should immediately do the pci and if the patient of this uh, multi vessel coronary disease uh, comes with st elevation um, uh, st elevation mi again we have to do his this uh, complete revascularization either during the index procedure or within the 45 days and if that this is these are the two basically class one indications which are given in the green if the patient with non st elevation comes uh, with triple vessel disease we can plan the surgery and uh, uh, for the this is a class 2a uh, recommendation and uh, patient will need complete revascularization there will be functional invasive evaluation for the non uh, infarct related artery during the index procedure this i have already discussed so in st elevation mi the time is muscle we have to take the immediate action we have to administer all necessary medicine like aspirin high dose statin clopidogrel iv heparin we have to when we thrombolize the patient or if the PCI center is within two hours of range. We can send him to the for PCI, and if we know that uh, patient uh, PCI center is not available, or send by sending the patient, it will take more than two hours. Then we will thrombolize the patient. After thrombolysis, we have to repeat the ECG after every 60 to 90 minutes, and uh, we have to see the resolution of the ST elevation, symptoms relief, hemodynamic status of the patient and the patients who show the resolution they are again shifted for the primary PCI and all the failed thrombolized patient they again need to be sent for the uh, PCI after PCI we have to uh, sorry before and after thrombolysis we have to give high B heparin it can be given as a bolus dose of 60 to 70 units per kg maximum 5000 unit IV followed by, followed by the infusion of 12 to 15 units per kg per hour uh, and then maintenance dose but we have to keep the APTT in the range of 50 to 75 second this I have already discussed that after PCI or thrombolysis patient will have to stop smoking there should be reduction of the alcohol intake he has to do the graded exercises, risk walking for 30 minutes, 5 times in a week, diet, monitoring, aspirin, clopidogrel, 
which I have uh, mentioned in the chart how to monitor them. Now the patient, if the patient comes with the non-ST elevation MI, we will again give the loading dose of aspirin, clopidogrel or prosugrel with, along with the anticoagulant. If the patient is clinically unstable, we will do the uh, immediate PCI and if he has intermediate or high risk, the we can wait for the PCI for 72 hours. In the meantime, we will give him aspirin, prosugrel, ticagrel and if there is a uh, low risk patient, we can manage with the aspirin, ticagrel, anticoagulants like uh, clopidogrel. So we will screen such patient for high risk, low risk and intermediate risk. For risk assessment, we have a global registry of acute coronary events, gray score. Here we have five, six criteria like age, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, creatinine, ST segment deviation in, in the ECG, abnormal cardiac enzyme, features of heart failure. And similarly, we can categorize them as uh, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. L if the gray score is less than 88%, it is a high risk, uh, it is a low risk, and the six monthly mortality is 3%. Intermediate risk is 89 to 118, and the six month mortality is 3 to 8%. The high risk patients are if the gray score is more than 118 and the six month mortality is more than 8%. So, the, all the NST elevation MI patient, they should be treated with the aspirin, clopidogrel, nitrates, or beta blockers. We have to give them low molecular weight heparin and uh, statin also. So, if we see uh, the patients uh, whether we should choose PCI or fibrinolysis, PCI is basically percutaneous coronary intervention that is standing of the patient it is preferred over fibrinolysis because uh, whenever the patient comes to us ST elevation the, our first preference should be PCI if the patient has a heart failure or a cardiogenic sh shock PCI is preferred if there is contraindication to fibrinolytic therapy then PCI is preferable if there is any history of recent PCI or prior CABG if the symptoms greater than more than 12 hours then again PCI. In all cases of fibrinolysis, they again have to be shifted for PCI. Failed fibrinolysis cases, they have to undergo PCI. So PCI is preferable over the uh, fibrinolysis. PCI, primary PCI is preferred if the door to needle time is less than 90 meter, me, 90 minute. So if the patient has ST elevation MI who, who is having symptoms ongoing symptoms and it is more than 12 hours also again the PCI is preferable in which patient we should do coronary artery bypass grafting if the patient has a severe left main disease refractory ischemia and dissecting of failed PCI if the patient has a abnormal coronary anatomy not amenable to PCI or if there are any mechanical complication of the myocardial infarction so the long term management after acute coronary syndrome will be in the form of smoking, ses uh, smoking cessation, healthy diet, regular exercises, healthy weight, psychological management. Besides this, uh, the compliance to the antithrombotic therapy, lipid lowering therapy, annual influenza vaccination, proper adherence to the medication and target should be blood pressure, systolic blood pressure should be kept less than 130 mm and diastolic less than 80 mm. Cholesterol level should be less than 55 milligram per deciliter and HbA1c level should be monitored and they should be kept in the target of less than 7. So friends, this was all about how do we should approach to the patient of a coronary acute coronary syndrome mm, I have taken references from Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine 20th edition Washington Manual of Medical Therapeutics European Society of Cardiology Guidelines 2023 for acute coronary syndrome
before concluding my lecture just a few mi equivalents are de winter syndrome here we see a j point depression and uh, up sloping st depression in v1 to v6 that continues into tall positive positive symmetrical t wave and often within 1 to 2 mm st elevation in the avr this is a deep interest syndrome posterior st elevation mi st depression here st depression is seen more than 0.5 m millivolt in v1 or v1 to v3 or v4 especially if there is tall or wave in v1 v2 with rs ratio more than 1 in v2 when we have valen sign a and valen sign b here we see biphasic anterior t waves this is biphasic anterior t waves in the chest leads unbalanced phenomena deeply inverted t waves or hyper acute t waves all these are the uh, stemi equivalents and these should not be ignored and they should be treated at par with the mi and should be properly evaluated this is all about the acute coronary syndrome its approach any comments or question please drop in the comment box thank you